Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Greg Peterson here, and welcome to the 289th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where three days a week we work together educating and inspiring you to become part of your food revolution. Nature doesn't waste energy, and by using these natural cycles to work in our favor, we can harvest both plants and fish. Let us teach you how. Just text GROWFISH to 33444 or visit IWANTTOGROWFISH.COM and you'll receive our free webinar on how to grow your own fish-powered garden. Today on our podcast, we have someone who wants everyone to appreciate a very special fruit. We're talking to Andrew Moore all about the pawpaw fruit. Andrew grew up in Lake Wales, Florida, just south of the pawpaw's native range. He is a writer and gardener and now lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. His first book, Papa, In Search of America's Forgotten Fruit, was published through Chelsea Green in 2015 as a hardback and this year as a paperback. It was also nominated for the James Beard Foundation Award. Congratulations, by the way, on that. Welcome to the show today, Andrew. Thanks so much, Greg. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Absolutely. I'm a big, big believer in planting fruit trees, and I know like zilch about a pawpaw, so I'm very excited to talk to you. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Yeah, so the the path I took today, being uh, someone who can talk for hours and hours on pawpaw, started, I'll give you the, the, the long, middle, short story. Perfect. I, I moved to Pittsburgh in 2009 from Florida, experienced the first winter of my adult life, and then in 2010, was introduced to pawpaws at, at a pawpaw festival, believe it or not. Oh, wow. And Yeah. And so I had gone through my first winter ever, and I was in Ohio at this pawpaw festival and was introduced to these temperate fruit trees growing in Ohio that looked like mangoes and tasted like tropical fruit you'd have in Florida. And I could not believe that there was such an interesting fruit growing in, in this climate. Wow. And that's really what set me on this path was just this, this really curiosity for this fruit. I just had so many questions mm-hmm. and was, was very interested in it. And then, you know, as we, as we talk today, I guess I'll, I'll unveil some of that. As I investigated the fruit in the tree, it really represented to me a, a crossroads of so many interesting things of American history and ecology and so on. And so I devoted chunks of the next five years to working on this book. And, and that's where we are today. Wow. All right. So what is a pawpaw? Yeah, let's start there. So the the pawpaw is the largest edible fruit native to the United States and Canada. Wow. So it is big. It's this big tree fruit that grows in the eastern United States, 26 states, in fact. So a big chunk of the United States from the Atlantic west into eastern Oklahoma and Nebraska, even from southern Louisiana to southern southern Michigan. So this huge swath of, of the United States. So it's our biggest native tree fruit. And it, curiously enough, actually happens to belong to a tropical fruit family. Uh, I Anna wondered Asia. about that. Yes. So if any of your listeners are familiar with cherimoya, guanabana, soursop, custard apples, this fruit is actually related to that. And it's the only member of that tropical fruit family that's not found in the tropics that's found in our temperate climate. So botanically speaking, it's a it's a black sheep. It really sticks out. It's really unusual and unique in that way. So it's our biggest native fruit and it belongs to this tropical fruit family. But then most of all, in terms of what is a pawpaw, most of all, most important of all, it tastes great. It tastes, you know, it's often described as a a banana mango combination or a a vanilla custard or or something along those lines to describe it. And then when you reflect on where you are, so I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, you know, we're going to have winter soon enough. And the fact that not only does this thing grow here, but it's native to this area is super fascinating. So that's what a pawpaw is. Wow. And how you you've said a couple of times that it's the largest fruit. How big is it? 
So when I say it's the largest fruit, if you were to go out into the woods and, and hunt and find a, a wild pawpaw, you might come across something that's no bigger than a, a fig. And you'd say, Andy, this isn't very impressive. This isn't you know, very big. <laughs> right. But then you might go to the next wild patch or to a garden where you know someone growing a pawpaw. And you can find fruit as big as a grapefruit, over a pound, wow. over a pound of, of custard. So they can get very large. And again, larger, you know, larger than persimmons, larger than certainly any of other fruits that are native to the U.S., but then also a big pawpaw can be bigger than, than certain apples and things. So, wow. um, so it can get quite large. Wow. So in your introduction, you mentioned American history, and this has a piece in American history. I know that you know, we know that Johnny Appleseed was a real person. And the reason we have so many varieties of apples here in this country is because he was spreading the seeds of apples all over the place. Tell us the history of and how it's connected to, you know, the American history, the pawpaw. Absolutely. And that is, you know, as much as I love interacting with the fruit, when I did my research, I, I may have even loved interacting with its history even more. You know, seeing how this fruit, this fruit that still grows in the United States connects to, to our history. Mm -hmm. and, and pawpaw has been here long before people arrived in the United States. In the fossil record, it goes back perhaps as far as 56 million years. Oh, whoa. So the American story can, can be told through the pawpaw. It's thought that the extinct megafauna, the large animals mm -hmm. that were on this continent, would have eaten pawpaw. And, and that's really why it looks and smells perhaps the way it does. A large, fleshy fruit would have been eaten whole and, and, and transported across the continent by the large megafauna. And then, you know, to summarize millennia uh, in a couple of sentences, every human being or every, every civilization that was on, on, on this continent uh, interacted with, with pawpaw. So starting with the earliest North Americans, Native Americans, uh -huh. ate and, and used pawpaw, not just as a food, but as a fiber, the, the tree oh, bark. Oh, right. It, it, inner tree bark was woven as cordage. And there's lots of stories of, of tribes using it for, for various purposes. And then, you know, as, as Europeans came to the continent, they, they experienced it. They were experiencing so many new things that, you know, Papa might not have jumped out in their journal entries as this most incredible fruit. As we see it today, you know, looking back on that history. Uh-huh. But pawpaws were there from the beginning. You know, the, the Soto expedition chronicled pawpaws. The settlers of Jamestown knew and, and, and wrote about pawpaws, even all the way up to uh, the, the, the founding fathers, Jefferson and Washington. They, they knew pawpaw and, and had it growing on their property. Wow. So this is a well-researched book. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Where did you come up with all of this at? Various means. So first of all, the book is both a historical account of Papa, but also the living history or the current portrait of Papa. So lots of traveling um, mm -hmm. and interviews and talking to people and uh, going around the country. When it came to historical research, it was a combination of time in the library and, and time on the computer scanning mm -hmm. documents mm -hmm. and, and just looking for the word Papa or old time spellings of Papa or even looking for Native American terms for the fruit. So just scanning documents, looking for this, and going from one lead to another, looking for this information. Yeah, one of the more interesting sources for, for information about older history with Papa was looking at the map. You can read Americans' familiarity with Papa by looking at place names. There's dozens of, of Papa towns throughout the country, Papa rivers and other Papa oh, places. Oh, yeah. And then going back even further for Native American interaction with Papa, where there is significantly less citations, you can look at Native American place names. When they translate to English, they tell you things like Papa Thicket River or the Papa Eaters or Papa Town. So when you look at these Native American place names, you can start to develop a, a picture of, of wow. how the has been important to these people, important enough to name places and people right. after. Yeah. How long did you research this book for? The better part of probably four years, as I worked other jobs and traveled and lived a normal life, I was working on this book as well. But every year, for, for about four or five years during pawpaw season, I traveled the country uh, to meet people who were growing pawpaw during pawpaw season, uh, but also to go to some of these historic sites in American history where pawpaws grew. So, for example, I traveled to the Missouri River in Missouri to, to see the site where Lewis and Clark's expedition ate pawpaws and wrote about it. 
and, and sites like that. So I traveled a good deal for four years and then also just working in the library and, and working in my, my home office. Wow. How cool is that? So I want you to think back over those four years that you were researching this and tell me about the coolest thing that happened, the coolest thing that you found. Just kind of plug back into that moment when it was like mind expanding for you. You got one of those? Well, there, there's so many. And, and thankfully, part of the book is travelogue. Um, so they're all in the book as well. And, and it really felt like all of these revelations were, were really cool because I came to this as a pawpaw novice. Uh-huh. I didn't know anything about this fruit. And so the book, the narrative format is a first person narrative as I discovered everything about the pawpaw. So I'm able to share that with the reader. But this is a it was a genuine expression. So I, I, I knew nothing about this fruit. And as I, I, I researched and traveled and all of this stuff, everything was a new revelation to me. So that was exciting and a great experience to have. I will say, you know, I, I'm failing to come up with the, the one example. But looking back, when I traveled to these historic sites, it was incredible to see pawpaw growing just about everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, the, I mentioned the Lewis and Clark Right. Um, site. I went to, you know, historic Williamsburg and Yorktown and Jamestown, these early American sites. And pawpaws grow almost like a weed in that area. They're, they're all over the place. And so that means that, you know, the founders of this country were surrounded by this fruit and no doubt eating it. Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, George Washington's Mount Vernon. I found pawpaws there, too. And so these very historic, revered American sites are, are surrounded by pawpaws. And so just to, to think about you know, the, the, the history of, yeah. of this country and all the things, good and bad, that happened here. And that, uh, you know, pop up, maybe it wasn't the most important thing uh-huh. uh, to those folks, but it was certainly there. It was present in all of this and a, a footnote, at least, in all of these yeah. interesting events. Yeah. Well, I, I happen to have a copy of your book here, and I'm kind of glancing through it as we're talking. And I, I, I want to read this book. This sounds very interesting because you're telling stories uh, like Johnny Papa Seed, I mentioned Johnny Appleseed. Tell me about that, Johnny Papa Seed. Johnny Papa Seed. It's a nickname. I'm not sure if Neil Peterson enjoys that name or not, but it's one that's kind of sticking. Johnny Papa Seed is Neil Peterson. He's he's one of the the people who can be thanked for the current Papa revival that we're living in. Uh huh. I see. Chapter seven is also Peterson's gambit. Yeah, that is Neil Peterson. He, starting about 1975 and, and beginning in earnest in 1980, Neil Peterson, when he first learned about pawpaws, he was fascinated like I am, like so many people. But Neil wanted to take pawpaws out of the woods, bring them to the people, bring them to agriculture even, and, and, and turn this native fruit with so much potential, this fruit that's been fairly neglected for generations, yeah. and, and bring it back. And so what he did was... He set out to establish an experimental orchard where he grew out the best fruit that he could get his hands on. And and the way he got this great fruit is also interesting and fascinating and and comprises an entire chapter in the book. But he searched the country and historical record to find the best pop-off fruit and then grow the seeds of those trees out in an experimental orchard and conduct a, a traditional breeding experiment. Wow. Um, to do advanced selections of pawpaw, to find the best pawpaws, mm-hmm. and then propagate it and, and do analysis on, on how each tree performed. Really, really incredible work on his own dime, on his own free time. You know, he wasn't sponsored by a university to do this. And, and really is, is a, you know incredible story, not only for pawpaw growers, but also just as an example of one person's drive and, and how someone with an idea can really have an impact. So because oh, yeah. of Neil's work now, Thanks to all of that commitment for decades he spent doing this, we now have some really fantastic pawpaw cultivars that he has named. They're known as Peterson pawpaws, and they they bear the names of uh, American Indian rivers with American Indian names, so Susquehanna, Shenandoah, Potomac, also places where pawpaws grow. So he's named his, his pawpaws after his cultivars after these rivers, and they're really incredible, a really a, a gift to us who want to grow pawpaws. They're these wonderful fruits. So his story is really incredible for so many reasons, especially because of the fruit that resulted from yeah. his uh, labor. Wow. So given they're so delicious, why aren't they more known like apples and pears and peaches? 
Right. That's the that's the question. That's what drove me to do this investigation and to find out, you know, why? Why aren't they at supermarkets? Why aren't they more common? Why aren't people growing them in their backyards? And it's a nuanced story. It's a long story. You know, things often don't happen for one reason. But if I had to summarize it fairly quickly for you, the idea is that this was a fruit earlier generations were very familiar with. You uh -huh. know, Native Americans knew it. Colonialists knew it. Pioneers on the Appalachian frontier knew it. Folks in the Midwest pioneers knew it. And then there was a process of forgetting. The fruit was abundant and still is abundant in the wild. So it never needed cultivation in the way that the, the fruits of, of Europe would have needed, the way, you know, the, the way folks grew apples in the United States, things like that. You didn't have to have a pawpaw orchard to have it. You could just go into the woods and get it. You know, over the past century, though, we've stopped going to the woods for food. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, a more urban society, a more suburban society. And, and frankly, you know, much of the culture just doesn't interact with those wild places and, you know, wouldn't eat wild food necessarily. Certainly that's not all folks, but a, a huge chunk of the population isn't doing that kind of thing. And since it never needed cultivation, there weren't orchards to rely on. So you couldn't then go to the grocery store and get your pawpaw fix. So it's really this process of when we stopped going to the woods for food or even just pleasure and, and pastime, we stopped knowing about pawpaws. <laughs> wow. So, and I'll bet you go in depth on this in your book, right? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So are they easy to grow? Let's talk about cultivating and growing them. Are they easy to grow? So yes, the pawpaw can be quite easy to grow. You just have to give it, like anything else, as you're familiar with fruit trees and any kind of tree, really, you have to make sure the conditions are right. But otherwise, it's it's an easier tree to grow, mm -hmm. especially with the, the fruit. You know, this may change in a, in a dozen years based on, you know, pests arriving or pests finding pawpaw. But at the moment, there there's very few pests that will bother the pawpaw and, and they don't bother the fruit. So it's something that folks are growing organically. There's really no need to spray a pawpaw for, for pests. Even folks who tr use tr you know conventional methods and who do rely on, on pesticides for other crops, uh -huh. they don't find any reason to spray a pawpaw. Yay. It's good for, for many reasons, and this is one of them, the fact yeah. that it can easily be grown organically. The other thing about, so that's fruit, but you know, getting a tree established and making sure the tree is healthy and, and happy. We say that the pawpaw likes moist, well-drained soil, which is sort of, I feel like that's the holy grail of, grail of soil. So lots of water, but, but well-drained. So it mm -hmm. doesn't like swampy or waterlogged soils. Even in the wild, you can take notes on, on where it grows in the wild to figure out how to grow it. It grows on riverbanks, but not on the low-lying floodplains um, necessarily. The, the 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 maybe the historic floodplains, but nowhere that floods regularly. Right. Will you typically find it? So a little bit up off the river. So moist, well-drained sites. Yeah. One of the other nuances and, and quirks about pawpaws is that in in the wild, it's it's in the understory. It's a it's a, a smaller tree growing in the understory. But if you want fruit, the more sun it receives, the more fruit it will produce. Of course. So it's this quirky thing where it's it's content and thrives and lives well in the understory. But if you want it to produce fruit, you might want to put it in more sun. So in its first two years as a young seedling, it's very sensitive to lots of sun and to drought. So you mm. have to keep it well rotted in those first two years. And you may need to protect it from sun. So even something as simple as a tomato cage with a burlap sack around the, the western uh, the afternoon sun can be sufficient. But then by year three or four, as the pawpaw is, is established and growing, it can do extremely well in full sun. In fact, I'm looking out my window at my backyard trees. They're in direct sun all day long, and they do well there. And they, they do produce more fruit in the sun. And for our listeners out there that are in Phoenix, Arizona, like me, who I'm, I've been wanting to try pawpaws, full sun does not mean Phoenix, Arizona. Yes, and I should remember that when I talk about pawpaws, especially to your national audience. Correct. So even even in the deep south where they're native, you know, you may want to give some shade. I've talking to growers who've been growing them for a couple decades. They find that some of their trees even live longer if they get a little bit of a break from that afternoon sun. So certainly in your desert climate, that you'll have to be the pioneers that figure out how it's done there if you want to grow there. Perfect. Yeah, that's that's what we do here in the desert. We try and figure out how to make this stuff grow. So what are people doing around the country with the pop-up? We talked about Neil Peterson. What about others? 
Yeah, so I, I mentioned this earlier. I, I really do think that we're living in this this moment of of the pawpaw revival. You know, and your listeners know that we're experiencing this gardening revival, this oh, local big time. foods. Yeah, yeah, and and it really does feel like it's a sustainable movement. That it's not a fad. That people are actually genuinely interested. Not only are they interested in it, but realize that you know sustainable food systems and all of this is key to our survival as a civilization. So that's the broader context of what's going on and, and people's interest in these things. So that's one avenue that people come into pawpaw, but, but also just people want to eat this interesting fruit, you know, for, for nutrition, for flavor, you know, the, the taste is again, unlike anything else we're growing in our, in our part of the world and, and it's connection to history. So there's, there's many, there are many avenues and reasons why the pawpaw is experiencing its, its revival. The other thing that's happened is just, there's some great folks doing great things with it. The way I learned about pawpaw was this Ohio pawpaw festival and, and the festival organizer there, Christian Meal, is a permaculturalist who wanted to make use of this fruit that grew, you know, millions of trees in Southern Ohio, where this festival is. And he, he has created this festival that's now in its 17th or 18th year. That wow. Is this, this three-day happening in Appalachian, Ohio, in this, this beautiful setting where people come from all over to celebrate the pawpaw. The impact he's had in, in raising the fruits awareness has been incredible. So not only does he do this festival in his, his own farm, he actually is the largest, if not only, commercial processor of pawpaw pulp. And he ships frozen pulp around the country. So this fruit that was for generations, a wild fruit and then a forgotten fruit can now be ordered in frozen bags from a permaculturalist in southern Ohio. Integration Acres is his farm, which is just really telling of, of the revival and how far it's come. No kidding. How cool is yeah. that? And, and others are growing it at a bigger scale as well. There's a commercial farm in central Maryland that has over a thousand trees. And he, this farmer, he and his wife mail fruit, fresh fruit all over the country. And more and more folks are doing this. Every year, people are planting dozens, in some cases, hundreds of pawpaw trees and seeds. So in a few years, we may have, you know, more pawpaws than we know what to do with. And I think that's a good thing. There's a lot, a lot of folks growing it now. And people are doing neat things with the fruit as well. The craft brew revival, uh, beer revival, is interested in pawpaw. So there's, you know, a dozen breweries in Ohio that make pawpaw beer. And in just about every state in the eastern U.S., you can you might you might find a pawpaw beer on tap. People are experimenting with it and people are other making other products like pawpaw ice cream and, and pawpaw gelato is also something that folks are doing. Wow. OK, so now I'm motivated to go order some fruit. When are they in season? That's the question. This is it now. Um, oh, the month of yay. The month of September, roughly, for the Mid-Atlantic, Ohio Valley is, is pawpaw season. It's a little earlier, obviously, further south and then later further north. Uh, there's some great pawpaw producers in, in southern Michigan, and their season will start uh, about the 1st of October. Perfect. And remind me again who I can call and have some shipped to me. So you would get fresh pawpaws from Earthy Delights, and I believe that's earthy.com. And then frozen pawpaw comes from Integration Acres. Cool. All right, everybody, order your pawpaws up. How cool. So I'm looking in the back of your book. You've got uh, section two or appendix two in the back of the book, a selection of pawpaw nurseries. Oh, and you have a pawpaw ice cream recipe, but then also cultivar profiles in appendix three. So you've really, you've really done a lot of homework about the who, what, when, why, and where of pawpaws. If you want to know about it, the book is Pawpaw in Search of America's Forgotten Fruit by Andrew Moore by Chelsea Green Publishing. All right, cool. So let's shift. And I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that fear, and what you might have learned from it. Sure. I'd love to talk about my failures publicly <laughs> on your podcast. No. <laughs> so I thought about this and I thought about this question and I, I don't I hope it's not a cop out, but I will say that I experience failures almost on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I, I think I, I set up each morning I wake up and I have a things to do list. And, you know, each season, even as a as a gardener, I have these ambitions. I'm going to grow X many peppers and make so much fermented uh, pepper hot sauce and uh you know, I'm going to try to do this and do that. And um, so I, I don't know if it's, if not doing everything on my uh, ambitious to-do list is a failure or not, or if setting up too high expectations is a failure. And that, you know, I, 
to be sort of happier with a my garden and, and b my productivity. Mm -hmm. Just realizing that uh, you know you've only got so much time in a day and energy, and, yeah. and 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 be happy with the things I do accomplish. Be happy with say my papa crop this year, and and never mind yes. the peppers. And you know, obviously hoping to continue to improve as a gardener, as a person, and all of those things. And just I guess also realizing that you know not making one thing this year or not growing something gives you something new to do next year. Yeah. So. Yeah, I hope that ha works for an answer. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, you and I have the same challenge. It sounds to me like your to-do list right now is greater than anything you'd handle in your life, and you add new stuff to it every day. Correct. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, amen to that. So my learning from, from that over the past 15 years is to be happy with what I have right now, what's here, and you know what, what happens in the future will be magical, but be happy now. Yeah, and... I like that. And, you know, I have a, another anecdote along with what you've just said is Please. there was a corner store in my neighborhood with graffiti on it. And the whole building had recently been repainted and they did not paint the graffiti. They left it because it had a message, I guess they liked or something. Uh -huh. And it said it did say what you just said, essentially, what if God only blessed us in the future with the things we're thankful for today? Yeah. And I liked that. But then I also always told myself I should take a photo of that. And I kept putting it off. And then it eventually got painted over. Mm. Uh, so <laughs> I should have been thankful and taken a picture of it. But yeah, now it's gone. Go. Anyway. Go. So what do you consider your biggest success? Probably, I should say, marrying the woman I married two years ago. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. I've been two, I'm two years in as well. So yay. And I'm, Heidi is just amazing. Go ahead. So sure, yeah, meet, meeting her and you know meeting such a supportive person and having her in my life is probably the best thing uh, I did. Yeah. Hey, cool. What drives you? Curiosity and I guess a, a real you know love for for the world and uh, looking around and just being fascinated by so many things and and staying open to that. And at this point, reminding myself to stay stay curious and to stay open to the you know, the interesting things and the beautiful things around us. Yeah. That's one of my biggest lessons in my life. I've, I've never stopped learning. I, I went back to school late in life. I didn't get back into college until I was 39, but I never stopped learning along the way. You know, that's that curiosity. It's like, I can't help myself. That's right. Yeah. There's always something new and to, and to get the joy out of it. Not, not to think of learning as like a, a burden or, you know, a test you have to take, but to just keep realizing, oh, this stuff enriches every day, the more yeah. you learn. Yeah, exactly. If you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? Yeah. So if you like my book, A History of Papa, or if it sounds interesting to you, I would also recommend this wonderful book by Susan Frankel, it's called American Chestnut, The Life, Death, and Rebirth of a Perfect Tree. Not only is that a great title, it's a wonderful book about the American chestnut story. And it's the whole rise and fall of a tree that was important to Native Americans and early pioneer Americans, mm -hmm. and, and then the fall of it, and, and what, lessons, what lessons to learn from it, but also what things to be hopeful about the possible resurrection uh, of this American chestnut. It's a great book, so if you like if you're interested at all in, you know, narratives about a tree, this is a, a really great one. Perfect. Perfect. And what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? So I'll, I'll keep it pawpaw centric, the advice. And uh, if you want to grow pawpaws, no matter where you live or no matter what you've been told, try it. We're seeing folks growing them in the desert of Southern California, Utah, Central Florida, where they're not supposed to be. And then even farther north, we're seeing them in uh, Vermont. Uh, and Minnesota, places where you don't find pawpaws. Um, so if you want to grow them, just go for it. Give it a shot. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Andrew. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? Yeah, if you want to find me, first you can go to chelseagreen.com slash pawpaw. Mm -hmm. I'm also on all the social media. So there's a pawpaw page, In Search of America's Forgotten Fruit, on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram. Andy Moore, 44. Perfect. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash pawpaw. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Nature doesn't waste energy, and by using these natural cycles to work in our favor, we can harvest both plants and fish. Let us teach you how. 
Just text GROWFISH to 33444 or visit IWantToGrowFish.com and you'll receive our free webinar on how to grow your own fish-powered garden. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.